Hi everyone, my name is Scott, and I'm from Los Angeles, I have a story to share with you. Two years ago, a car accident left me blind, but my kind cousin let me stay with him and his wife. Though I couldn't see, I could still hear. Every night, I heard noises from my cousin and his wife's bedroom. One day, I suddenly regained my sight. As I was about to share the news with them, my sister-in-law, wearing only a towel, came into my room. Around 11 p.m., I was lying in bed trying to sleep when I heard passionate noises and the sound of a bed rocking rhythmically next door. My cousin and his wife were at it again. Why aren't you making any noise? Are you a corpse or something? My cousin said. She, Scott is in the next room. My sister-in-law, Sophia, replied. He's been asleep for hours. Besides, he's blind. What can he do if he hears us? My cousin said. Sophia's trembling voice made me react involuntarily. I'm such a beast, I'm having thoughts about my sister-in-law. I cursed myself inwardly. I lost my sight not long after graduating from college. I was hit by a car while trying to save a little girl who was crossing the road. The doctor said a blood clot was pressing on my optic nerve, and I had to wait for it to disappear to regain my sight again. Thankfully, my cousin took me in, or I wouldn't have had a place to stay. And now, all I could think about was my sister-in-law. I was grateful but guilty, and immediately heard more sounds of my cousin and sister-in-law expressing their love for each other. In an attempt to not hear the noises from next door, I covered my ears, but my sister-in-law's voice grew louder and more penetrating, almost deafening. I decided to try and clear my head by picking up a book and hitting it against my head. Suddenly. My sight returned, I could see, overjoyed, I wanted to share the good news with my cousin immediately. I got out of bed and headed straight to his bedroom. My exhausted cousin turned his head and unintentionally made eye contact with me. In an instant, his face became contemptuous, and he slapped my sister-in-law's buttocks. Witnessing this scene, I quickly pretended that I had to use the bathroom and left quietly. When I returned from the bathroom, my cousin was getting dressed and preparing to leave. We passed each other without speaking, and his bedroom door remained closed. I returned to my own room. Not long after, I heard the faint sound of footsteps outside. My cousin pushed the door and left with a loud bang. Then my sister-in-law, wearing slippers, headed to the bathroom, and the sound of the shower flowing on the ground made me feel annoyed. My mind was overwhelmed by the alluring and sexy figure of my sister-in-law as I had passed by her room earlier. Instead of telling my cousin and sister-in-law about my regained vision, I decided to take my time because the events of tonight felt quite awkward. There was a knock at the door. Are you free now? I need to get something from inside. Sophia asked. Sophia, wearing only a thin bath towel, caught me off guard, and I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened earlier. Suddenly, Sophia knocked on my door and asked. Scott. Are you awake? No, I'm not, I quickly replied. The door opened, and Sophia slowly walked in. I widened my eyes as she entered the room. She walked into my room with a smile, her feet wet and her hair and face sprinkled with droplets of water. Sophia didn't seem to mind and used one corner of her towel to dry her hair while loosening its already loose knot. It felt like it was about to fall off any second. Ah, the shower stopped working halfway through my bath. I came to your room to get the toolbox. I think the nut on the water tank is loose, causing the water to leak. She said. As she spoke, she took a few steps towards my bed, and bending down, she reached under the bed to retrieve the toolbox from beneath it. Little did she know that this action had caused me to see almost half of her body, and I suddenly felt overcome with a strange feeling. Sophia knelt on the floor, struggling to locate the toolbox for some time before finally retrieving it. She was breathing heavily, her chest heaving up and down. That was quite the workout. Sophia muttered to herself. Hey, sister-in-law, do you need any help? I asked. No, it's okay. You rest and take care of yourself. Sophia replied, pulling out a wrench from the toolbox and heading to the bathroom. Just two minutes later, as I was about to lay down and rest, I heard a piercing scream coming from the bathroom. 
I immediately rushed to the bathroom, concerned that something had happened. Sophia was sitting on the bathroom floor, soaking wet, holding the wrench in her hand and looking at me in confusion. The valve is broken, and I can't turn it. The water splashed all over me, and I think I twisted my ankle. She said. Are you okay? Let me handle it, I replied. Sophia pulled me up with her arm as we both struggled to stand up. Her bath towel was completely soaked, and as we tried to fix the valve, it was clear she wasn't fully covered. Sophia suggested that we shut off the valve, and we would fix it once her husband returned. However, with a few simple turns of the wrench, I managed to fix it without any trouble. It was effortless, and I hardly had to exert any effort. Sophia had twisted her ankle, and I helped her walk to her bedroom. We both sat down on the edge of the bed, and I let out a long sigh. It's great to have a man in the house. Sophia said to herself. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I said, a little confused, looking at her. It's nothing. Oh, and by the way, Scott, I just sprained my foot. I heard you recently learned massage. Can you help me with it? My cousin runs a massage shop downstairs, and I work as a blind messer for their shop. I've been learning for a year now, and although I'm not particularly skilled, I can still give a decent back rub or foot massage. Sure. I nodded, pretending to still be blind as I reached for her small foot on the bed, gently massaging it. Her feet were particularly beautiful, with freshly washed toes that looked especially cute and round. There were faint veins on the arch of her foot as well, which I took note of. She had just taken a shower and was wearing only a bathrobe, which revealed her entire body at a glance. At the corner of my sister-in-law's mouth, she emitted a coquettish moan, a seductive groan. Her fair and plump thighs were straight and slender, covering the beautiful scene inside. I was massaging Sophia's ankle, kneading and rubbing, and she was enjoying it with her eyes closed. I had originally thought about telling her about what I could see, but now I think I'll hold off for now. Scott, I consider you a little brother of sorts, so there are some things I want to talk to you about. My sister-in-law said, as I continued to massage her foot. My dear sister-in-law, you're also my real sister-in-law, I replied, increasing the pressure in my hands by a fraction, prompting another pleasurable moan from Sophia. Your brother isn't a real man. She continued. I was taken aback and didn't understand what she meant. Keep massaging. She said. During the moment of confusion, I had stopped massaging her foot, but I resumed right away, freely kneading and rubbing it. In fact, you heard us back then, didn't you? My sister-in-law lay comfortably on the bed, with a slightly red face, as one hand slipped into her bathrobe and massaged her chest. Scott, you're not a kid anymore and I know that you overheard what happened between your brother and me in this room. Oh, she was referring to their lovemaking in this room. I nodded. Suddenly, it dawned on me, she said my brother wasn't a real man, and that's what she meant. I hadn't been able to sleep tonight, hearing noises from their room next door and then seeing them stop fighting when I went out, both taking no more than three minutes. Three years after we got married and we haven't even had a child yet. Who knew that your brother would be like this? How can I not become a widow? They say that women are like wolves when they turn 30, and tigers when they turn 40, and my sister-in-law was now 28, the perfect age to be a wolf. The problem was, how should I respond to such an explicit and awkward statement? Scott, come and have breakfast. She said, and I got dressed and went to the dining room. I decided to bite the bullet and tell her that I had recently learned some traditional Chinese medicine massage techniques that could help my brother with his premature ejaculation and impotence. I offered to give him a massage whenever I had the time. But my sister-in-law didn't respond to my suggestion, and the room fell silent. I continued massaging her legs while she held her hands over her chest, her eyes looking unfocused. Finally, she murmured. Scott, wouldn't it be great if you could see? When I returned to my room later that night, it was already midnight. My sister-in-law had already fallen asleep, so I quickly wiped myself off with an old shirt and went to bed. The next morning, I woke up early, but my cousin wasn't home, as he had spent the night elsewhere. My sister-in-law had already prepared breakfast in the dining room. 
I was stunned when I saw her because she was only wearing a shirt that left little to the imagination. Holding her chopsticks and a bowl, she walked towards me, her curves perfectly accentuated, her chest trembling and tempting me. She must have thought that I couldn't see her, so she was reckless in her behavior. My lower body reacted instantly. Feeling flustered, I quickly finished my breakfast and grabbed my cane before heading down to the massage shop. However, my cousin was nowhere to be found. He didn't show up at the shop all day, and in the evening, my sister-in-law called to ask me to bring a bottle of essential oil home with me. She said that I had helped her massage her feet and legs yesterday, and she felt much lighter and more relaxed while walking. Tonight, when she finished work, she wanted me to help her massage a little more at home. It was my first day back to work after regaining my sight, so time flew by quickly, and soon it was already evening. When I got home, my sister-in-law had already cooked dinner, but my cousin hadn't returned yet. Despite this, she didn't appear to be worried at all. I asked her nonchalantly where my cousin had gone. Who cares? He's been gone for a day, and probably won't be back tonight. She replied. My sister-in-law then emerged from the bedroom, wearing a sexy nightgown and flip-flops, revealing her creamy white toes. She was smiling brightly and had prepared a large table of delicious food. Scott, my dear brother-in-law, I know you've been working hard, so I made some extra dishes tonight. Please give me a good massage later. She said, sitting down in front of me and putting food in my bowl with her chopsticks. I looked at the dishes she had made, stir-fried pork kidneys, stir-fried Chinese chives, yam, and carp. They were all nourishing foods, were they not supposed to be for my brother, I was a bit confused, but my sister-in-law was very enthusiastic and kept pushing more food into my bowl, insisting that I eat more. After dinner, my sister-in-law watched TV in the living room while I locked myself in my room and played around on my phone, something I hadn't done in almost two years. Watching some short videos got me quite excited. Just then, there was a knock on the door. Scott, are you free? Could you help me massage my leg? At this moment, my sister-in-law pushed open the door and walked in. As she entered, I was shocked. She walked in fully naked, without a single piece of clothing on and turned on the lights. I could see every part of her body clearly, and it was the first time in my life that I had been in such close proximity to a woman's body. The sight of her writhing body made me feel uneasy as I was tempted to commit a crime. Although I knew she did it because I couldn't see her clearly, it was difficult to control my desires when she walked into my room without any clothes on. My sister-in-law held a bottle of essential oil in one hand, which I collected from the store today, and a glass in the other, in which a small, white, undissolved pill was seen. Scott, can you do a full-body massage? How about giving me one? Sophia asked as she sat beside me with the oil and glass in her hands. As she sat so close to me, I could see every pore on her body. She handed me the glass and urged me to drink some water due to the hot weather, and then asked me to help massage her. Without waiting for my response, she handed me the glass, and I noticed there was still an undissolved pill on the bottom. I was taken aback and realized that she had drugged the drink without my knowledge. I had thought the water was for her, but it was actually intended for me. As I glanced at my sister-in-law's fair skin, the thought crossed my mind that my cousin was not at home tonight. Could she be trying to do something inappropriate to me, just as I was about to refuse, Sophia's soft voice rang in my ear? Scott, why aren't you drinking? I said I wasn't thirsty. Ignoring my reply, she picked up the glass and insisted that I drink some water, telling me that I might get thirsty later. I felt like I had no choice but to take a sip. Sophia was eager to begin the massage and handed me the essential oil, but I still had a nagging feeling that she had drugged me. As I started to massage her, I was impressed with the soft and smooth feel of her skin. However, she didn't react in any way and kept her eyes closed. I pressed on one acupoint on my sister-in-law's back after another and was already sweating profusely. Breathing heavily, I continued the massage, becoming less anxious and more relaxed as time went on. Sophia's body was smooth and silky, like a piece of silk. I glanced up at her and was suddenly startled. At that moment, my sister-in-law was lying on the bed, with her cell phone camera turned on, recording my every move. The camera captured her naked body in full view. Questions flooded my mind, 
wondering what she intended to do with the recording. Suddenly, a feeling of drowsiness overcame me, and I felt my eyelids getting heavy. I tried to shake my head and stay awake, but my body began to sway unsteadily. The sudden sleepiness felt strange and almost intoxicating. I heard my sister-in-law calling out to me faintly, Scott, Scott? Then, my mind went blank, and everything went black as I collapsed onto the bed. I passed out. The next time I opened my eyes, it was early morning, around 7 o'clock. My head was throbbing, and I suspected that Sophia had drugged me with a powerful sleeping pill. Looking down at myself, I was completely naked, with only a blanket covering me. I wondered if Sophia had deliberately seduced me while I was unconscious. I quickly got dressed, put on my sunglasses, and stepped out of the room into the living room. As I looked in the mirror, I noticed a spot of blood at the corner of my mouth, and my heart sank. Could my cousin have found out about what happened last night? I panicked. But being blind, I couldn't do anything except play dumb and pretend nothing had happened. My sister-in-law was cooking in the kitchen with her bedroom door shut tight. Hey, Scott, you're awake, she said as she brought breakfast to the table. There were bruises on her eggshell white face that couldn't be easily ignored, and it was clear to me that she was a victim of domestic abuse. An evil thought crossed my mind. As we sat down to eat, I was trying to figure out how to inquire about last night's events when my sister-in-law spoke up first. Scott, you must be tired from working at the store every day. Oh, not really. Thank you, brother and sister-in-law, for giving me this opportunity, I responded. You look exhausted to me. You fell asleep after just a few strokes on my back last night. How about taking a break today and resting at home instead of going to work? Consider it a day off for yourself. She suggested. It's already morning, I replied, scratching my head awkwardly. By the way, I don't remember anything from yesterday. Did my cousin come home? I asked. My sister-in-law gave a quick glance toward her bedroom door and said. No, he hasn't come back, and we don't know where he went. Hasn't your cousin been gone for two days now? I asked. I don't care about him. Eat your egg, it's good for you. She said, forcing an egg into my mouth and stopping me from talking. Later that day, at dinner time, my sister-in-law suddenly said that she would come home early and buy some spare ribs to supplement my nutrition. I took it as a kind gesture, finished my dinner quickly, and went downstairs to the store to start my work shift. Throughout the day, my mind was elsewhere, and my right eye kept twitching, as if something bad was about to happen. I couldn't shake off the uneasy feeling that something was wrong, especially when I smelled the strong scent of blood that seemed to follow my sister-in-law. Why did she record a video and drug me? And what had caused the bruises on her face this morning? I mulled over these questions in my mind and wondered if she was trying to seduce me to conceive a child because my cousin was unable to do so. It was a dark thought, but I couldn't help but consider this possibility as a man. As a result, when my brother found out about the situation, he beat his wife brutally, which seemed logical except for the fact that they had recorded the incident on video. I am now regretting having to face my cousin tonight after he learned about the incident. I spent the day in confusion and finally arrived at my cousin's house around 6 p.m. As I approached the door, I could hear the exaggerated sound of someone chopping meat with a cleaver inside the house. Upon entering, I called out, sister-in-law, is anyone home? Oh, it's just Scott. You've come back. My sister-in-law replied, panting and holding a cleaver. As my sister-in-law emerged from the kitchen, wearing a bloodstained apron over her pajamas and covered in bloodstains, including bruises on her face and hair that appeared to be in disarray, I felt a sense of unease. Go rest in the room first. I'm just cooking some pork ribs. I'll call you when it's ready. She said before returning to the kitchen with the cleaver in hand. I immediately turned to leave, passing by my cousin and sister-in-law's partially open room. Through the small gap, I caught a glimpse inside and noticed several men's clothing items scattered on the ground, all stained with red blood. Upon closer inspection, the clothes appeared to be the same ones my cousin had worn the day he left. Why were they covered in blood? Was my cousin the victim of a crime? Were we really just cooking pork ribs? The room was in disarray, 
and the confusion only added to my growing sense of unease. Suddenly, a strong feeling of unease washed over me. I had only been in my room for ten minutes. Could it be that my sister-in-law had killed my cousin while pretending to cook pork ribs? Was she dismembering his body as we spoke, the thought terrified me, making my blood run cold. I sat in my room, feeling like a nervous wreck, not sure what to do next. Should I call the police? Tell them that my sister-in-law had killed my cousin and dismembered his body, I held my phone, torn between making the call and hesitating. Just then, I heard footsteps outside my room. My sister-in-law had returned, wearing slippers and calling me to come eat dinner. What was going on? Only moments ago, she had been chopping pork ribs. How could dinner be ready so quickly? Oh, the pork ribs are taking longer than expected. Let's eat something else first. She said calmly. As she spoke, she wiped the bloodstains from her face with a towel before leading me to the dining room. She served me a bowl of rice and meat soup from the pressure cooker, which, from its aroma, I could tell was chicken soup. There were several other dishes on the table as well. Go ahead and start eating. I'm going to take a shower. She said before returning to her room instead of the bathroom. Moments later, I watched her carrying my cousin's stained clothing into the shower as the sound of running water filled the house. The chicken soup tasted weird, with a hint of chicken flavor and something else that I couldn't quite identify. I was scared and didn't dare drink it, feeling increasingly anxious. I still wanted to call the police, but if I did, everything would be exposed, especially the fact that I had pretended to be oblivious to the situation. What's more, what if my suspicions were unfounded? My sister-in-law had been kind to me, and I didn't want to ruin our relationship. I felt torn, but something felt off about the situation, especially after she had drugged me with sleeping pills the night before. There had to be something more to the story. I couldn't sit still as my sister-in-law emerged from the bathroom, wrapped in a bath towel, her body glistening with water droplets. Her skin smelled of the shower gel's fragrance that made her alluring, like a seductive viper. She noticed that the chicken soup in front of me remained untouched and asked if I wasn't feeling well. I quickly made an excuse, saying that I didn't have an appetite for the soup, and would eat the other dishes instead. My sister-in-law nodded thoughtfully and poured me a cup of water before taking a small white pill from a bottle in the drawer and dropping it into my cup. She shook it once, but the pill had yet to dissolve before she offered me the drink. I refused, fearing that I'd be knocked unconscious or worse, dismembered like my cousin. I hastily made an excuse and took a few bites of food before quickly excusing myself to take a walk. Without waiting for her response, I made a dash down the stairs, gasping in the fresh air outside as I walked. I had made up my mind. I was going to report the incident to the police. The nearest police station was not far from my place. And now that my vision had been restored, I could run there. Within ten minutes, I arrived at the station and shared my suspicions with the police officers. I told them that I suspected my sister-in-law had killed my cousin, dismembered his body, and dyed the house in blood. I also mentioned that the perpetrator was still in the house. The police seemed puzzled by my sudden revelation and questioned how I had seen it all. I claimed that I had witnessed it firsthand and that my sister-in-law even tried to drug me earlier. The police officers gave me a scornful look, realizing that I had pretended to be blind while working as a massage therapist. Despite their initial skepticism, they understood the severity of the situation and quickly dispatched police cars to my sister-in-law's residence. As a witness, I couldn't accompany them, so I waited at the police station, anxious for an update on the situation. After about an hour or so, the police car from the police station arrived, and they swiftly escorted me out of the station. At that moment, my cousin's bedroom door opened, and the few people who had left with me had returned with him. They scowled at me accusing me of making a false report and telling me to roll wherever I came from. They were annoyed because they thought it was a significant case, but it turned out to be a wasted trip. I quickly asked what happened, and they told me sternly that there was nothing wrong at home, and the most important thing was that my cousin was still alive and well. All the stories of murder and dismemberment were fabricated, the police had searched the house for any incriminating evidence but found nothing. On my way back, I couldn't stop thinking about the bizarre situation. Despite my apprehension, I went back to my cousin's house. 
When I entered the house, I was hit by an aroma that filled the air. My sister-in-law was wearing pajamas, vacuum-packed my cousin's recipe, and serving it on the dinner table. Saying, Oh my goodness, Scott, you came back at the right time. The ribs are freshly stewed, come and eat while it's hot. Scott's back? A man walked out of the room slowly. But this man was not my cousin. This person isn't my cousin. Even though I'd been blind for two years, a person couldn't change so much that they didn't resemble themselves anymore. Plus, I had a brief encounter with my cousin a few days ago. These were clearly two different people, although at first glance, they might have looked a bit alike, and their voices were somewhat similar. My sister-in-law furrowed her brow and commanded. What are you doing here? Go back to your room. She then handed the man a plate of food and a glass, telling him not to come out. I could tell from his lips that he said, He's a blind man. What's the big deal? The man smirked at me, said something but didn't speak aloud, and was quickly shoved back into the room by my sister-in-law. She poured me a glass of water, laced with sleeping pills, with a stern warning to drink it. You have to drink the water, do you hear me? I'm going to check on you later. She scolded me. I began pretending to look sleepier and sleepier. After my sister-in-law went to the kitchen, I quickly found a flower pot and poured the water from the glass into it. When she returned, I pretended to have drunk the water myself. As time ticked by, I felt it was time to make my move. Casually greeting my sister-in-law, I swayed to my room and climbed straight into bed, pretending to sleep. Not long after, my bedroom door opened slowly, and by the sound of the footsteps, I knew it was my sister-in-law. She sat down beside me and gently placed her hand on my cheek, her soft and tender fingers touching my face coolly, making me feel particularly comfortable. Then, her hand slipped inside my shirt, tracing along my back to my neck. The feeling made me want to shudder unconsciously, but I managed to hold it back. I'm sorry, Scott. I had no choice but to do this. My sister-in-law said with a sigh, continuing to speak in a lowered voice. You're asleep, so I can finally confess. I'm the one in the wrong. I'm sure you know that your brother isn't capable of pleasing me. We've been married for so many years, and we've always wanted to have a child, but we never succeeded. I wanted you to stay home with me today, but you insisted on going to work. I've already made up my mind. Anyway, it's just an insemination. It doesn't matter who it is with. At least you're my brother, your brother's brother. As she finished speaking, my sister-in-law burst into tears, crying louder and louder until, after a few minutes of silence, she finally wiped her tears. After that, we went to the hospital and found out that it was your brother's problem. He was afraid of losing face because he couldn't have children and was laughed at by everyone in the village. He told me that he wanted to find his friend to have a child, asking me to bear someone else's child and raise someone else's kid. I refused, and he hit and cursed me. He even brought his friend to us today. Oh well, it's fate. I might as well have yours. My sister-in-law said sorrowfully. I'm sorry, Scott, forgive me this time. I wanted to comfort her, but the situation made it awkward, and how could I explain that I wasn't blind and hadn't taken any sleeping pills? It was so damn embarrassing, my body was flipped, and my sister-in-law's cold hands began unbuttoning my shirt one by one. I knew what was going to happen next, but suddenly, I felt a wave of drowsiness creeping over me, wait a minute, I did not take any sleeping pills, and I had poured the water into the flower pot. Why was I feeling so heavy? The sleepiness came too fast, and I couldn't resist it at all. Before my thoughts went completely blank, I had one last theory, did my sister-in-law put sleeping pills in the rib soup, too, soon after, I lost consciousness. When I woke up again, it was early the next morning. Like the last time, I was naked, and my head hurt. I was also very tired. Without a doubt, my sister-in-law had succeeded in her plan last night. I checked the clock, and it was already 8 a.m. Except for the bedroom, the doors to my cousin's and sister-in-law's bedrooms were wide open. They were clean and well-organized, and the strange thing was that there was no one else in the house. Not only was my cousin missing, 
but my sister-in-law and the man who came to the house yesterday were also gone. Normally, at this time, my sister-in-law should have been at home, which was strange. I ate a few bites of rice and went to the massage parlor downstairs. That day passed by in a daze. I was thinking about revealing everything to my cousin and sister-in-law and finding a new job since I couldn't keep pretending to be a blind messer forever. When I arrived home that evening, I was surprised to find my cousin and sister-in-law both at home, whispering in their bedroom. My cousin had a grin on his face as he hugged my sister-in-law, while my sister-in-law looked disdainful when she saw me. Ignoring my cousin, my sister-in-law stood up, smiling and asking if I was tired. This made my cousin angry. And I thought this was the end of it, a less than satisfactory conclusion. After all, everyone has their own little secrets. However, there was one more thing behind all of this. In the following days, life returned to normal, except for my sister-in-law, who became a bit more enthusiastic towards me. A few weeks later, one morning, I pretended to be excited and told them that I had slept well and regained my vision. My family rejoiced, and my cousin and his wife even took time off work to take me to the hospital for a checkup, paying for all the expenses themselves, which made me feel embarrassed. Fortunately, the checkup revealed no issues and the blood clot in my brain had disappeared without any long-term effects. Thank goodness. About a week later, I planned to resign from my job, but one afternoon when I returned home from work, I heard banging and clattering behind the locked door. Male and female voices were yelling in anger. It was obvious that my cousin and his wife were having a fight. Upon entering the house, I saw the chaos and destruction caused by their argument, with my cousin holding a belt in anger and my sister-in-law's body covered in bruises, which made me feel sorry for her. What the hell is happening? I quickly stepped in to intervene and persuade them to stop, but my cousin responded by kicking me. He shouted that he had worked hard to provide for me, give me food and clothing, and even paid me a salary. He accused me of betraying him and humiliating him by having an affair with his wife. He then grabbed a chair and charged towards me. Shocked by his sudden outburst, I didn't react quickly enough and was hit in the back with the chair. Things were getting real, and my cousin was still furious, claiming that he wouldn't have known about the affair if it weren't for the video on his wife's phone. I tried to explain and justify myself, but it only fueled his anger, and he continued to throw things at me. Unable to tolerate their abuse. Despite being in the wrong, I had to defend myself. I tackled my cousin to the ground until he calmed down and we could talk. He insisted that I was responsible for ruining his marriage and his life, and he vowed to divorce his wife and seek revenge on me. I knew that it was time to leave. I glanced at my sister-in-law, who was weeping uncontrollably. I quickly gathered some of my belongings and left with a heavy heart. My cousin threatened to kick his wife out and divorce her. As the only party directly involved, I accepted the court summons, wondering why my cousin, who had a weak physical condition, and even had a surrogate mother for his child, could be so impatient and angry today. However, I kept my thoughts to myself. Silently packing her belongings, my sister-in-law and I left my cousin's house. I felt that my cousin was a despicable person, and my sister-in-law was forced into this situation, she had been beaten and bruised for days. In a park, my sister-in-law cried and expressed her grievances. I comforted her and assured her that I would stand by her, even if it meant going against my cousin. Several days later, my cousin and sister-in-law sought legal counsel and filed for divorce. My cousin accused his wife of adultery and demanded that she leave with nothing. His wife denied the allegations and brought up the fact that he had been abusive and had even raped her to have a child. Both parties presented their evidence in court. Taking a deep breath, I revealed the truth. My cousin was a violent husband who had beaten his wife severely twice and had even arranged for her to sleep with other men to have a child. I also told the court about how I was pretending to be blind at the time and how the local police who witnessed it could testify. In my opinion, both parties were at fault in this situation, as my sister-in-law did have a physical relationship with me. Therefore, both parties would probably get a fair share of the property and go their separate ways. However, to everyone's surprise, my sister-in-law provided a medical report proving that she had never been pregnant and had only been intimate with my cousin in the past month. She also produced the full video footage of our encounter, 
showing that I had only rubbed her back innocently and then fell asleep without doing anything inappropriate. Thus, my sister-in-law had not committed any marital misconduct, and my cousin was the true culprit of domestic violence. My cousin was also stunned and claimed that he had no knowledge of the surrogacy situation. With evidence and witnesses on her side, my sister-in-law won the case, and my cousin was ordered to leave with nothing. My cousin had lost everything, and I was frozen in place. He looked at me with hatred, as if wanting to eat me alive. As I witnessed my sister-in-law's victorious expression, I realized that everything was part of her plan. It was deliberate from the beginning. The first step was when my sister-in-law noticed that I had regained my vision on the very first day. She caught me and my cousin in the act of his wife's affair, and my sister-in-law noticed my physical reaction. Later, she intentionally wore a towel to confirm whether I was truly able to see. Obviously, being in the presence of her intoxicating body, I couldn't resist and had a reaction. That was when my sister-in-law confirmed that I had indeed regained my vision. So, from this point on, everything had been a well-planned trap by my sister-in-law. On the first day my sister-in-law drugged me, she recorded a video of me being undressed intentionally. There were two reasons for this. The first was to provoke my cousin's anger and gain my sympathy for being a victim of domestic abuse. Secondly, it was to reveal the sleeping pills to me for future steps. The video was shown to my cousin to expose her injuries and gain my attention later on. The second step was when my sister-in-law faked her injuries to seek my sympathy and create a foundation for me to report her husband. I believed that my cousin was dead. And I had to report the incident to the police. This allowed for a police officer to provide evidence that I was pretending to be blind, crucial for winning the court case. The third step involved the bloody clothes and cut-up pork ribs. My sister-in-law used them to create a story about an unknown man and drugged drinks. I pretended to drink the spiked drinks before falling asleep, and this allowed my sister-in-law to tell me some truth about my cousin's behavior. This unknown man was not a surrogate father, but rather, it was all an act. Oh my god, which man would do such a thing? All of that was intentionally told to me by my cousin-in-law, just so I would testify against my cousin in court and get him sentenced to death, she did it to make her own tragic life stand out, hoping that I would sympathize with her and believe that she, as a delicate woman, had slept with me. Therefore, I would stand on her side without hesitation, even at the cost of betraying my cousin. It was a malicious plan, and I was just a fool who was being used. The loser is my cousin, and the winner is Safina, well, the story has come to an end. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We have more videos available, please visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel.